My name is Tom Hairgrove. I'm a veterinarian with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. A long time ago, when I graduated from vet school, we had definite thoughts about equine parasites. We thought that they were principally tied to colic. We had deworming programs. Again, things have changed a lot in the last few years. But a lot of the old concepts, the stuff that we talked about 30 and 40 years ago, we're still trying to apply today. We do have parasite resistance in small ruminants and other animals, and, and definitely some hints of it in the horse. So that's what we want to address today. Jennifer Zoller, the, uh, the extension specialist, is going to be with Dr. Craig from vet school. We're going to talk a little bit about new concepts and changes. My name is Jennifer Zoller, horse specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And I'm Tom Craig, uh, College of Veterinary Medicine, Texas A&M University. Okay, Dr. Craig, first can you tell us what internal parasites horse owners should be most aware of and how those might cause colic? Well, when I was a young veterinarian, a parasite called Strongus vulgaris caused more colics than all other conditions put together over the world. This parasite uh, lived for a period of time in the blood vessels that uh, provide the, the blood for the intestine and it would get blocked from time to time and horses died. That parasite is an endangered species. <laughs> we haven't seen it very much recently. It has largely disappeared. This is the year 33 AI after ivermectin and that seemed to be the one thing, although there were several other very, very good uh, drugs that would kill this parasite at an, a stage in its development, which was very, very important to the horses, and it has largely disappeared. Thank goodness. <laughs> we do have a couple of others that can cause uh, problems from time to time. Uh, we've got a, um, a tapeworm uh, that uh, will be seen from time to time uh, that uh, can cause some, some problems. And ivermectin won't touch it at all. And um, uh, we also have some of the small cousins of this really bad guy that from time to time, particularly in young horses, when there's movement of large numbers of them from the uh, wall of the intestine into the lumen, which oftentimes occurs in the springtime when the days are getting longer as you may have noticed is happening now <laughs> some of these if they emerge in large numbers can cause some colic mm -hmm. and and those are the the major things from a parasite standpoint that that we associate with colic at this time very good and can you tell me when different classes of horses should be de dewormed and what types of products should be used for those horses well here we have to look at Foals are different from adults. Foals have another parasite, foals and weanlings, that, we, that we call Parascris, and that's a, a large worm that lives in the small intestine. And uh, this, this parasite produces eggs that are in the environment that will live for years. And if a foal picks up one of these eggs, uh, it will get an adult worm, and the adult worm just doesn't go in and become an adult worm. It goes into the horse and then migrates through the tissues, through the liver, lungs, and up, bit coughed up and swallowed. And then it becomes an adult. And all of that movement through there causes some problems. And then when there's large numbers, as we have seen from time to time, in the small intestine, that foal is in trouble. Mm -hmm. Those worms are illiterate. <laughs> they don't know that ivermectin is supposed to kill them, and it doesn't anymore on many, many places. And that's something that has to be looked at at the individual farm. Mm -hmm. But we find that some of the other drugs that we used to use for Strongest vulgaris, etc., are much better against that in foals. Mm -hmm. So I, to me, we have to have a whole different situation of what we deworm foals with from what we deworm adult horses with. Mm -hmm. And we, we don't want to try to use the same thing in both many times. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
<laughs> so is there a difference between housing environments and horses? Say horses stalled versus horses in the pasture with what uh, par parasites are Absolutely, more absolutely. The strongiles, the small ones and the big ones, this is where they live. This is a perfect pasture for them. And I can't see any larvae out there right <laughs> now, but, but this would be a very good place. Close to the ground, uh, they would, they, uh, the larval stages hatch out of the egg, they get up on the vegetation, and when it's cool in the morning, there's a little bit of water out there, it's called dew. And that's what they love, they dance in the dew. And then when it gets drier, uh, they kind of just sit around and wait for the next morning. But if a horse comes by and eats them, they've had it. That's where those parasites come from. The other critters, like the Parascris, and uh, uh, well, particularly Parascris, is one that um, the egg is the infective stage. The eggs tend to accumulate in stalls and in, in, in on dry lots and things of this nature. And unless they're in complete sunlight and a very high temperature, they're going to be there for year after year after year. So we usually we find that the, the eggs that the foal ingest this year are from its brethren from last year or the year before. Mm -hmm. And so that's an, one important difference. There's another one, the pinworm. We only find that associated with, with a stable. Why? Because um, pinworms, the adult female, lives in the lower part of the digestive tract. And when the horse is resting a little bit, they sneak out and they lay their eggs around the anus. Mm -hmm. And she puts it there with a little sticky stuff. And that sticky stuff kind of itches. And when horses itch, what do they do? They scratch. <laughs> and what do they scratch? The rear end. <laughs> and then we have to remember that, oh, what else do horses do from time to time? Well, some horses will come up and say, oh, I want to chew on this wood, this post, this something like that. And they pick up the egg that was produced there yesterday or the day before or something. Mm -hmm. Those eggs don't live long, but they live for a little while. And that's how that one gets transmitted. And so we'll see rubbing horses, rubbing their rear ends and then chewing on on wood or something else that, mm -hmm. that's solid that they'll pick up the egg from that environment. Okay. And and then there's a, a, a third one that we'll see from, from time to time that's associated with, with house flies. You may have seen a house fly or two a around few. a horse barn. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's one that um, the, the house fly uh, will um, sort of be the source of the infection uh, and um, horses will eat ho house flies. Not because they're chasing after them, but because the house flies think that that, that food, particularly if there's a little bit of something sweet on it, is really good. Mm -hmm. And mm, they're eaten right away. <laughs> but they can also do a, a few other things that are even more damaging to the horse that these house flies uh, can uh, walk around on a wound uh, or something of this nature on the genitalia if it's moist and deposit uh, some of the larval stages that will enter into those tissues and that can be really serious. Mm -hmm. We call them summer sores because that's when the flies are, are most out is in right. the summer mm -hmm. and that's when the, the uh, transmission occurs. Okay. Dr. Craig, we've heard a lot about refugia in the literature. Can you tell us a little bit about what refugia is? Refugia is a term that they use as a, a, a place for refuge for the worm. Mm -hmm. And that can be out in a pasture uh, when before the worm has, has died off in that pasture. Uh, he's in refuge because he's protected from too much sunlight or something of that nature. The other is inside of a horse that's not treated. And the refugia worm, at least in theory, and there's some good information to indicate that this theory has got a little bit of, of uh, evidence as well, is that those worms are not being exposed to any of our drugs. Mm -hmm. 
And if they're not being exposed to any of our drugs, they've not been selected for resistance for their offspring. And so then if a horse comes by and picks up one of these worms from the refugia, uh, then it doesn't have the genes for the resistance to the drug. And our drugs will last longer by, by doing that. And, and I think really important thing to keep in mind is that if we've got a group of horses, say there's 20 horses out there, four of those horses will have 80% of the worms. The others don't have very many. Those should be the refugia. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. And the one that's got the really high numbers, well, it, we got to treat them because mm -hmm. they, they may have some problems. And so we, we want to do something about those. But by the same token, we'll find, uh, and, and this is again using another host as a, a, um, an example, but we find that, that say, if we've got some mares that always have very, very high egg counts, their babies are likely to too. And perhaps that should be one of the selections uh, of not using those for breeding. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, we do this a lot with some of our ruminants that have problems with the drugs. Mm -hmm. And the horses are going in that direction now. Okay. okay. Are we looking for, in our deworming program, are we looking to eliminate all of the parasites that are inside of the horse? No, we can't. They've been around for millions of years, and they're going to be around for <laughs> as long as there are horses. And in fact, there is some evidence, again, based on other animals, that being exposed to a, a moderate number of, of parasites is probably a good thing for the, the horse over its lifetime, mm -hmm. a moderate number, not very many. We, we don't want to see disease infection is okay disease is not okay and okay. and so this is and this is one of the reasons that the refugia idea works really good because those animals with small numbers don't have disease those with large numbers could have disease mm -hmm. let's put our eff efforts on the ones that might have large numbers besides that they're putting more of the parasites out in the pasture if every bite had a thousand worms that'd be bad mm -hmm. if every day's worth had 10 worms, that'd be good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so can you tell us what the difference would be between infection and disease? Infection is a normal phenomena that happens with, with animals and parasites. And it's usually associated with a low number, enough that it will stimulate a protective immune response but not enough that it will bother the animal in any way. Mm -hmm. Disease is when we have that high number that may cause this problem in the spring when we have an emergence of large numbers or the large number of, of uh, uh, ascarids in the intestine or uh, the thing in the, on the skin of the, of the horse uh, or the, ooh, I got too many tapeworms in my belly hurts sort of thing. <laughs> if we've got small numbers, no big deal. If mm -hmm. we've got large numbers, then we have disease. Okay. And, and I think our philosophy, and this is, this is something that's very difficult for people to understand, is that there is a difference. And that we need to realize that we can't kill them all. Let's be prepared to live with a small number, and that's okay. That's normal. That's what they've evolved with for millions of years. Okay. Uh, what about uh, horses that are existing people own, like say five to 10 horses, and they are, uh, are we, as a recommended deworming practice, are we recommending that those horses get fecal exams as well? I think it's a good idea just to find out who your, your major donors are mm -hmm. to the pasture. And you may decide that there's one or two horses that you want to knock that level down. And you're going to find in general that the young horses, the, the one, two, three, four-year-olds, will tend to have higher counts, their immune system gets better. And then we'll find that the other end of the line, the late teenagers, or even if we have some that are old enough to vote, uh, those are ones that 
that are more likely to have the higher counts just because of, of age and exposure, immune system, and, and so on. The other seems to be very much an individual sort of thing that we'll find that at a certain time we may find this horse is fairly high and it's not high again for a long time. Mm -hmm. And only deworm those that, that need it under most conditions. Okay. And, and uh, uh, some of those most conditions would be, hey, if we've got some horses coming in and out, the uh, I mentioned the tapeworm. Mm -hmm. The tapeworm could come from a pasture, but it also could come from some nice fresh hay that came from someplace else. Because there's an intermediate host for the, the tapeworm, which is a small, uh, very small mite that lives out in the pasture and it looks mostly for insects to, to kill mm -hmm. but if it finds a worm egg it um, bites into the worm egg and sucks out the goodies and it becomes infected and the horse will eat it because they're on the vegetation because that's where the insects they normally feed on mm -hmm. are going to be and we'll find in this part of the world that most of that transmission of that parasite occurs in the latter part of the grazing season. Uh, in other parts of the country, it may be a different time of the year that we tend to see more of them. Okay. But that's one that that uh, we do see from time to time cause some problems. And, and one of the things that we'll see with horses that have uh, tapeworms before they get large numbers is they'll just do a lot more stretching and looking at their side like, I, I don't feel real comfortable, but then when they get going and you, you check everything else, everything else is fine, but mm -hmm. they're just a little bit uncomfortable. Right. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> the, the reason for that is that this species of tapeworm that causes the problem lives at the junction of the large and small intestine. It's a very small tapeworm, but if there's large numbers of them there, they are attached to this opening between the two and they sort of cause it to swell up and so that the normal gas that's produced in the gut gets held in the small intestine instead of passing out the other end. And that causes the horse to be uncomfortable. There are I rarely, there's been some other things where this has been completely blocked due to this particular parasite. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's one that in our part of the world, perhaps it wouldn't be a bad idea to maybe treat the horses um, as we go into the winter time with a drug that would affect that tapeworm, the strongiles that are in the, and some other things that will cause some problems from time to time, but don't cause any disease, bots. People have all seen bots and they think, oh, they're terrible. Yeah, the adult bot fly flying around makes horses uncomfortable. Do they hurt them? No. Does the bot in, uh, attached to the stomach hurt them? No. But uh, they do bother the horses. <laughs> and uh, so, not having them in there would be a good thing. And, mm -hmm. and many times we use a combination drug at that time of the year. And that is the, it also covers pretty much everything except the tapeworm. Okay. And, and to me, uh, if we're going to do a deworming of a horse at a time of the year, that would be the time. Okay. And that's what we'd get more bang for the buck. Okay. And any other deworming, Hey, if they need it, do it. If they don't, don't. don't. Okay. And that's what the fecal exam will tell you. Yeah, and that's what the fecal don't. exam will tell us. Okay. And the veterinarian, will they be able to recommend a product for, uh, depending on the results of the fecal exam? Should be able to. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, but a lot of that will have to do with, okay, what has been used on this place over mm -hmm. a period of time? What works on this place? And this is one of the things, particularly with larger uh, farms, but even small ones with 10 horses or something like that. This idea of, of testing the drug at that farm mm -hmm. every several years is not a bad idea. In other words, we get a sample before these guys have got high levels, we'll treat them, and then two weeks later we go back and we check them again. 
and our numbers, if they haven't fallen considerably, we're going to say, hey, that drug's out. Mm -hmm. How long is it going to be out? Well, probably after 40 or 50 years, be okay again. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think those horses will be there. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Dr. Craig, is there a difference between products like name brand versus generic deworming products? With the horse, I don't believe so. Uh, there hasn't been as much work done with them comparing uh, as there has been in others, but from the small amount of information that I'm aware of, they seem to be pretty much equal as long as they have the active ingredient mm -hmm. in this that works on that particular farm. Okay. All right. So, Dr. Craig, in the equine industry, uh, a lot of recommendations are for rotational deworming schedules. Can you tell me a little bit about why we're not recommending rotational deworming anymore and a little bit about seasonal deworming schedules? Okay, the, the main reason for that is that, um, as I learned many years ago, the destruction of the, the tragedy of science is the destruction of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. <laughs> and it was thought by, by changing one drug to another drug to another drug, we would, would keep the worms from becoming resistant to these drugs. And then science found out that no, in fact, it's just the opposite, that rotation will lead to the failure of all of the drugs faster than it would if we use one until it fails and then quit and move to to something else. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's one of these things that, yeah, it made really good sense. But doggone it, sometimes things make good sense don't work. And that <laughs> was, was one of the things that, that was found. So we might rotate, but we rotate because we're after something else at that time of the year, at that particular farm, uh, or that age of animal, or something of this nature. And I don't have any problems with that, but the rotation for the idea of, of preserving the, the drugs doesn't work. Okay. So we're recommending more of a seasonal deworming schedule now? More of a seasonal deworming uh, and um, uh, selection of which animals to deworm. Okay. Put our emphasis on young animals uh, and then uh, we'll be, let's, let's look at the others and just see. Okay. The distribution of worms in the population is like wealth in humans. Some have a lot, some have little. And we need to know who the big, big guys are. Okay, very good. So if a horse owner buys a new horse and brings it onto their property, what's their best protocol as far as parasite control? Well, the, the main thing is to take this horse and put it in a, a stall, a dry lot or something to where uh, the feces does not contaminate the pastures. Mm -hmm. Test them, see if they got worms. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if they do, treat them with uh, something that, that you would suspect would be effective against the worms, eggs that you're seeing. And then two weeks later, come back and retest and see if there's still eggs there. If there are, then use another substance Check again, and you may have to do this for quite a while. Okay. <laughs> There's a, a few few worms that um, have learned to get away from our drugs. <laughs> uh -huh. how, could, how would a horse owner go about uh, mm. scheduling an exam? Oh, this is fairly easy. Most uh, veterinarians um, will either, in their own facility, uh, have uh, a, an ability to do this, or they can send them through things like the Texas Veterinary Medical uh, Diagnostic Laboratory, other things of this nature, mm -hmm. just to get uh, fecal flotations, egg counts, things of this nature. And, and that's what we, we recommend. Okay, and will a veterinarian be able to recommend a product to a horse owner? Well, the recommendation of the product will depend on what it is mm -hmm. and what the history has been on that particular farm. And I think this is something that each farm should uh, periodically, every several years, evaluate, make sure the drug still works on that farm. Mm -hmm. If it does, let's go for it. <laughs> if it doesn't, let's make a switch. Uh, but we're, we're not gonna just make a switch because 
we think that it's a good idea, we got to have some evidence that we need to. Right. Howdy, my name is Jennifer Zoller, horse specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. And I'm Pete Teal, a professor with uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Research, Department of Entomology. Nice to meet you, Pete. Nice to meet you, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here today to talk a little bit about, about fever tick and how that's affecting the cattle industry here in Texas. Can you tell us a little bit about the historical perspective? Certainly, so if we go back in Texas history, all the way to the 1800s, after the Civil War, when there were lots of, of cattle uh, here in Texas and the, and the Texans were trying to figure out how to get them to market and many people remember the old Texas uh, trails and the trail drives. Um, the first trail drive went to Sedalia, Missouri from, from South Texas and subsequent to that five counties experienced a, an outbreak of a, of a fever in their cattle that ultimately became associated with Texas cattle, thus the name Texas Cattle Fever. Later it was associated that the ticks that were uh, feeding on these cattle were actually transmitting a pathogen from infected cattle to non-infected cattle and brought about this, this febrile uh, illness that ultimately real, um, translated into a lot of mortality. Uh, lots of records back then. So the Missourians didn't appreciate the Texans bringing cattle back to Missouri and the next year they met them with guns. So progressively these trails moved westward and this uh, westward movement also was related to the new rail heads where they could get cattle to rail and then to Chicago and New York and other places in the east. But consequent, subsequent to that, um, scientists, uh, as a, largely in response to industry requests to figure out what the relationship is between the ticks that were feeding on the cattle in this illness, led to the discovery, the first discovery actually, of an arthropod that could transmit a pathogen from infected to non-infected animals. That's a scientific discovery that was extremely important in, um, in medical and veterinary history actually. But subsequent to that then, they discovered that 14 southern states, from Texas through Oklahoma to Missouri, and all the way back to the eastern seaboard, were infested with these ticks, and that the disease and the ticks were the losses due to, directly to the ticks and then to the transmission of this disease were hindering the development of the cattle industry. As a consequence, they also figured out that the way to prevent the disease was simply to remove the ticks from the equation. So in 1906 and 1907, state and federal eradication programs began and they slowly removed these ticks from these 14 southern states all the way down to the Mexican border. So once that was accomplished in the late 18, in the late 1940s, excuse me, in the late 1940s, they established a permanent buffer zone. Mm -hmm. So USDA APHIS Veterinary Services has a tick force that numbers about 80 people and they ride the border 24-7 uh, to prevent livestock from coming into Texas, bringing ticks into them to keep this whole problem out. In Mexico, both the ticks and two pathogens that cause this disease are still endemic. They are still present there and, and pose a, a constant danger to us. So this recent outbreak in Live Oak County in Texas has caused a lot of concern because one of the methods that we use to stop animal movement is the use of quarantine. And this has impacted people and land uh, throughout the state of Texas as well as 19 uh, occurrences outside the state of Texas. Mm. So um, the impact then coming back to horses, uh, while we talked about cattle, we always use, we're using horses to work cattle, right? right? And we take horses as our companion animals on trail rides and things of that nature and may become exposed to fever ticks. So in South Texas right now, on these quarantine properties where there's an infestation or an adjacent property or even an exposed property, the only way that a horse is gonna be able to be permitted to be moved from that premise is gonna be by permit from the Texas Animal Health Commission. And that's to be sure that we contain this tick to these properties and then be able to implement programs to remove the ticks. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me um, is, if a horse has fe these fever ticks, is the, are they gonna get sick from those ticks? No, this okay. pathogen only affects cattle. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very similar to the relationship of malaria to humans, okay? Except that in the case of malaria, we're talking about the humans, the mosquito, and the, and the malaria pathogen. In this particular case, we're talking about cattle only, 
We're talking about this particular type of tick and the pathogen that's the interchange between the two. Okay. And there are no vaccines to prevent the disease and there are no drugs permitted for use in the United States once an animal becomes infected. It's confusing because a lot of people don't understand why are we addressing the ticks and not the disease. We're actually addressing the ticks to prevent the disease. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you. I understand that cattle leaving one of those quarantine areas have to be dipped. Mm -hmm. And what is the, the regulations with regards to horses? Okay, good question. So in a, in a certain sense, when we have horses working cattle, for example, or exposed in any of these premises, they're not only going to have to receive the permit to be uh, the permit for movement, mm -hmm. but they're also, if they're working horses, going to be put on a 14-day pass. Okay. And what that means is for every 14 days they have to be treated. And I think generally they're using um, a class of compounds known as synthetic pyrethroids to spray treat the animals. They're not put through a dip vat. Okay. However, the 14-day is really important because what it does is it shortens the life history of those ticks on the animals. It takes uh, 20 to 21 days for a tick to get completely through its its blood feeding cycle on the animal on a horse for example mm -hmm. and if we if we're treating them every 14 days we're terminating that we're stopping that okay. cycle mm -hmm. Very good. if a horse is already being treated like a, a, an owner is spraying them for for flies and ticks do they mm -hmm. also have to be treated again and and in addition to that. Right, I'm pretty certain that the treatments under the 14 day pass from an infested quarantine is gonna be have to be done under the supervision of the Animal Health Commission, their inspectors. Very good, and is there any toxicity related to these, the sprays that the TAH, TAHC is using? No, the, the synthetic pyrethroid class is one of the safest mammalian tox, uh, toxicants, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds kind of terrible, but it has <laughs> the, one of the best profiles of mammalian uh, safety. So that, that should not be a concern. Okay, very good. Can you tell us a little bit about the different quarantine zones and what each of those would mean? Certainly, so um, in, a, in a circumstance where cattle are determined to be infested, or it could be wildlife, and we'll talk a little bit maybe later in a, in a question about the, the more complicated situation we have today. Mm -hmm. Because back in history, we were pretty much a cattle-centric uh, production system in the state of Texas and today we're engaging in wildlife, uh, native species and exotics. Mm -hmm. So let's go back and let's just talk about a property that becomes infested. Animal Health Commission will come in and quarantine it as an infested premise. Okay, And the infested premise is going to be bounded by all of the fence lines through which infested cattle have been detected. Secondly, they're going to quarantine everybody else that's an adjacent, any adjacent property that touches that. And that, the reason for that is, what if a tick gets past that fence line, they need to be able to detect it. So they're gonna re restrict movement, and they're gonna, they're gonna dictate some treatment of animals before they would ever be released from that property. Mm -hmm. Then they may extend this out to a third la layer, a temporary preventative quarantine, and that's, be, that's that safety valve to be sure that it, it hasn't skipped over another area. Mm -hmm. So there's multiple areas. So you can realize that I believe right now in Live Oak County alone, there's 61,000 acres. Now that's not 61,000 acres of infested quarantine, but that's 61,000 acres of total quarantines of all these different layers. And what's impacted Texans probably more than anything out of this event has been that animals were traced out from the original infested property from the date they think the first infestation may have happened until we get to the current piece. So when they traced those animals out, they were all over the state of Texas, plus many of them outside the state of Texas. And that uh, is alarming to folks. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of the program, since I mentioned that the, uh, the, the, they considered the eradication program successful by 1947, in other words, getting it all the way down to South Texas with uh, border with Mexico. Mm -hmm. So all the people back in the interior of Texas and certainly throughout the southeastern part of the United States have been protected and they have forgotten what all happened over the, the course of more than 100 years. Mm -hmm. Now what's at risk today? So what's at risk today is this same geography. So if we lose control of the ticks, we've placed all of the cattle and more than 400,000 producers in the southeastern part of the United States at risk. Mm. And furthermore, when you realize that one third of the fed beef cattle in the United States originate in the southeastern part of the U.S., it's a significant impact. Wow. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and can you tell me how would a landowner or a producer be aware of a quarantine in their area? 
So they would need to go to the Texas Animal Health Commission website. Mm -hmm. They've got uh, information there. They can call them. There are regional offices in which they can maintain uh, communication to be sure of any changes, real-time changes. These things get updated on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. Can you tell me a little bit about what a trace out is? Certainly, so a trace out is in reference to tracing out animals that have moved from a, an area that's been determined to be infested to any other area in the United States, um, outside Texas as well as within Texas. So if an animal is, let's say, purchased from an owner of an infested property and they're able to trace that to another location, that location when, where that animal has landed is going to be quarantined as an exposed premise. It okay. does not mean that that premise is infested. What this does is it places a restriction on the movement of animals from that location until it can be ascertained that there is no infestation. Mm -hmm. Once that they've determined that, that, that the premise is not infested, they'll release that. If, however, they find that ticks had been brought by that animal to that location, then they'll change the status of that quarantine to infested to begin the treatment problem and then to also expand the quarantine zones around that to contain that situation to that location. The faster we can, we can contain it and the more rapidly we can start treating for the ticks, the quicker these things can be eliminated and we can get back down to our, our border area. Okay. And can you tell me about the buffer zone and how that's different from the other types of areas? Certainly. So when, um, when the program was uh, successful in the late, declared successful in the late 40s, they established a permanent quarantine zone that's actually defined. And, and it ranges from a matter of yards to as wide as two miles or a little more right along the Rio Grande River from Del Rio all the way down to Boca Chica below Brownsville. That permanent zone is overseen because it's an international boundary by USDA APHIS Veterinary Services, the tick force. Um, as I said before, there's 24 seven surveillance uh, of this area. Now, that area and people who raise livestock in that area have to do so under the, the restrictions of permanent quarantine. Mm -hmm. So if a day worker, for example, takes a horse to go to work on a property there, they are gonna be then subject to treatment, inspection, and the horse would have to be permitted to be removed out of that area, totally under USDA APHIS and Animal Health Commission restrictions. Okay, and how long is that permit good for, can you tell me? The movement permit? Yes, sir. The movement permit is a one-time removal. It permits you to move out of that zone. If you, and then you, you're free to go anywhere beyond that. If you, however, you return, that permit, that's gonna start all over again. Each exposure to that area is gonna constitute a new evaluation. And we should say that um, going back to this business about exposed premises, mm -hmm. the, uh, and the exposure of a horse from a day worker who might come to a ranch that is under a, an exposed uh, uh, consideration, um, that horse would most likely have to be uh, inspected and determined to be non-infested before a permit for movement would be um, allocated by the Animal Health Commission. Mm -hmm. Restrictions on this are uh, regulated by the Texas Animal Health Commission and depending upon the epidemiology of the circumstances the, the constraints involved in these things could change on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay and when you say inspection what what is the inspector looking uh, for when they go through that process? Yeah good question so <laughs> this is a physical inspection of the animal from its nose to its tail because uh, when ticks uh, get onto an animal their their intent is to get after blood so they're gonna come up the legs, or if the animal is grazing, they're gonna come onto the head. So they've gotta inspect all the opportunistic places. And these ticks are gonna look for um, areas that are covered, because it's gonna be difficult for the animal to groom, if you think about it in that context. Mm -hmm. So the axillary areas uh, under the, the venter of the horse, back up to the perianum, to the tail head, the tail, the mane, the neck, up the neck, under the chin, even the ears and the face, all of those areas. They'll inspect them from one end to the other. Wow, and would that inspection include any type of equipment that's used on the horse or no, the cowboy? No, it's, it's all physical inspection. Okay. Okay. And with horses, that's hopefully, uh, unless they're not halter broke or something, that, that's gonna be a pretty simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. You can imagine how difficult it is with cattle that don't see human beings very often. Right. That's a very difficult and dangerous job. Okay, will they be inspecting like trailers or saddles or all of that is included? 
in circumstances where they believe that uh, the conveyance, the truck or the trailer has been involved in moving animals from one location to another, that's going to be a concern. Okay. The commission will most likely, the inspectors will most likely inspect those areas and they're going to treat those areas. So they've got uh, a caricides or pesticides that we can use for that, for that particular purpose. They may be also concerned about the bedding material mm -hmm. and that bedding material could be composted in some way that it's not going to come into contact with any other animals. So the, because ticks actually can fall off of an animal into a truck or into a trailer, mm -hmm. they could lay eggs and if they don't clean out that truck, the next load of animals that come in there could wind up being infested and you could wind up then infesting other properties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Can you explain to me a little bit about the biosecurity practices with regard to like trucks and trailers going into those areas? Absolutely. So um, any conveyance, truck, trailer, um, it could be a car or anything of that nature if they happen to be transporting pelts from wildlife or something of the, in, that, in that context. Mm -hmm. They're going to be very concerned about ticks that might come off of animals or off of um, a, a cape, for example, mm -hmm. and fall into a conveyance and then remain there, lay eggs, the larvae emerge from those eggs and then get onto an animal or some other means of conveyance that would expand the, the infestation level. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be very concerned about it. They're going to want it cleaned. They're going to want to treat it. They're going to probably want to be sure that the contents of that conveyance were isolated and maybe put in a circumstance of, uh, of composting or otherwise removing it from any other contact. So biosecurity is a really important aspect and just in general terms, anytime you, you purchase or you move animals, it's a really good idea to isolate them and to keep them, don't mix them in with your, with your herd until you're absolutely certain that they're not, they're not carrying something. That's just a really good practice with any kind of uh, infectious agent or arthropod. Right. So you mentioned uh, an adjacent area and the different types of areas with, or with regard to quarantine. Can you tell me a little bit about how um, the ticks would pass from one area to the next or why we need that adjacent area? Right, so let's back up a little bit. We talked about in the beginning, um, we were pretty much cattle-centric um, until whitetails became really reestablished through the 50s and 60s and 70s. And we began to find that we were missing some infestations, that they were jump they were basically out beyond the, the current levels of quarantine. Mm -hmm. Thus, additional layers of quarantine have been added to this to be sure that we're contained. If we have an infestation and you start working out from this, have those ticks actually move from one locale, past another fence, past another pasture, and over into the third uh, layer. Mm -hmm. And this is to actually help capture this. A white-tailed deer, okay? We know that they are a host. We know that they will sustain a population. And, um, and what we've done now is to employ quarantine layers to help track this and contain it. And furthermore, USDA has developed some um, um, corn-based bait stations, if you will, with ivermectin-treated corn. They've also developed some um, wick applicators that uh, deer are drawn to corn, and as they actually feeding on the corn, they self-applicate and these applications have helped suppress those populations to get these things down to extinction. And we also use cattle, because cattle basically, if we're treating them on a 14-day basis, they basically act like a mop, going back out onto the landscape, reloading with larvae, bringing those back, and then they get dipped mm -hmm. or, uh, or treated with a spray machine, those, those kinds of things, mm -hmm. and actually removing the ticks. So we're actually removing ticks, pulling them off of the landscape, and using their primary host. Very good, okay. thank you. So can you tell me who is authorized to spray animals coming out of those quarantine areas? Right, so these would be the inspectors with the Animal Health Commission or the, the inspectors with USDA APHIS. And when they treat, they're going to treat with approved materials, um, meaning approved by the Animal Health Commission, that we know the efficacy against this particular tick. Um, for horses, they're primarily going to use, I believe, synthetic pyrethroids. Uh, they're very safe uh, materials. The application of it is, it is very important. So it's not just a casual spray onto the animal. They want to get that animal thoroughly wet and all of the surface areas they can possibly get wet. And since most horses are e easy enough to treat, uh, unlike a cow that's got to go through a dip fat, mm -hmm. that's, that's the choice of the, of the treatment. It makes it a lot easier on the horses. Okay. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about horses. What about the uh, considerations for other equine species? Absolutely, good question. So certainly other equine species, donkeys, mules, as well as horses and ponies, uh, all are subject to, uh, to be a host for, for cattle fever ticks. 
Uh, two other aspects of this would be uh, day workers, for example, that go work on a ranch. We've talked about the permits for movement, uh, for treatment, uh, for treatment of the conveyance or the trailers or trucks. Um, the other piece of this would be that they may uh, inspect and they may treat uh, the tack, things like the bottom of the saddle that's got a uh, wool lining to it mm -hmm. or saddle pads and things of that nature may be treated and certainly inspected. Uh, the other aspect of this is that uh, many people work cattle with dogs. Dogs and horses are a great combo. Uh, dogs will be a concern. We know that they can possibly be a host and will most likely be treated with the same class of uh, acaricides as those treated with horses. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome.